So um, this talk's going to be a little bit sort of thin because I have my laptop stolen and so <laughs> haven't had a lot of time to prepare it. But it's, it's broadly on testing Ember.js and, and ways to do that. And it's this, this particular version of this talk just deals with the, the high level. So my name's Jamie. That's what I look like on the internet mostly. Um, I work for With Associates, a web consultancy in East London. Um, and the first time we used Ember sort of seriously was on this kind of cute micro feature on the Best of All website back in 2012. So the idea is if you click this add to my lineup link on any artist and this appears in various different places on the site, it will add it to your personal lineup. You identify yourself with Facebook and then the site generates a kind of personalized festival poster for the year you went and the, the artist you actually cared about. And it proved pretty popular, um, kind of cute, useless thing that was a really good fit for data-bound templates. That's kind of why we picked up Ember at that point. We could just plonk bits of data-bound template all over the place and know that the bindings would take care of everything for us. Um, so that was mid-2012, before any real structure, before any real conventions, and definitely before the router. And Ember's come quite a long way since then. Um, it's now a really serious tool for building real apps, and real apps need real tests. Um, so let's start at the top and let's talk about acceptance tests. Um, I have a feeling that probably a lot of people in this room, I know some of you are Rubyists, will be familiar with full stack testing using the tools provided by the framework, if it's Ruby or Django or something like that, plus tools provided by your testing libraries plus something like Selenium to, to drive a browser through your test suite and sort of simulate real user interaction. And you, in Rubyland anyway, you use Capybara to interface with Selenium, driving as many browsers as you want, uh, aspect syntax. So you, you visit a page, you click some link, you fill in some form, and then at the end you assert that the, the state of the UI has changed to reflect what you expected it to. Um, I, I really love this style of testing because it forces you to just speak about interactions in terms of these primitives. You know, you can, you can look at a design or a piece of UX and sort of, it seems like a holistic thing and the user flows through it, but really it, all, it all always boils down to visiting URLs, clicking on stuff, filling in forms, maybe a bit of drag and drop or adding files in, but really, you know, you've, you have at some point to reduce to this, like quite small interface. So when you do these tests, this is the stack that you end up working with. So your, your test suite aspect, for example, will boot up an instance of your app, or maybe if it's several apps working in conjunction, it'll boot them all up. And then a, a database in the testing environment, maybe a queue, some kind of mock API if you're dealing with a third party service. And then it will spin up all the browsers you want to test with, and then it will drive through those using Selenium. And that works really well. I think it's really impressive that we can do that. We can run it on CI. You can use browser stack, and you can have Travis drive a load of browser stack browsers through testing your application. That's wonderful. So where does Ember fit into all this? So if anyone's used Ember Rails, you might you might think of it in these terms. So Ember is kind of the face of your Rails application. The, all of the, the, the CSS and the, the, the markup and JavaScript are sort of sitting as a thin layer on top of the real, the real guts and business logic. Or you might think of it on the other side of that line. It's its own, its own app sitting in memory in these browsers. And the nice thing is those tests that we wrote with Capybara and Selenium, they still, they still stand. It's still that same interface of clicks and URLs and filling in forms. It all still works great until you hit unit tests for your JavaScript, which you will want to do. You'll want to test that your component works with certain groups of inputs and you'll want to really thoroughly, you know, throw stuff at a helper and see that it does the right thing in different circumstances. You can't really test that in Ruby. So what tends to happen is you'll write a um, you write a JavaScript suite, and you will then have your this sort of stack that drives things with Ruby will then like boot up your JavaScript suite. Things like Canacha will do this for you. They'll 
it will load in your JavaScript test suite. It will get the results using tap or a format like that, if anyone's ever come across that. And then it will kind of display all these test results together. And that's, that's a way to do it like that. You know, can be made to work, can be made to work on CI just like everything else. But this is like, like the question I have when I look at this is, is like, what's your program in all of that stuff? Is your application really this kind of like tightly bound up stack that goes through from a complete GUI in the browser down to a Rails application or several services on, on different servers? through down to databases, are they really all so knotted together that you have to test them that way? And one of the best things about, about writing tests and practicing test-driven development is you, you run across boundaries in your programs. You're kind of forced to confront them, forced to mock them and figure out how small and simple you can make the interface between things. So those primitives, the interface between a human being interacting with your application is visiting URLs, clicking on links and filling in forms. There's not that much to it. You know, and you can maybe add events that can be triggered in the DOM, but even then it's, it's an event with a name and some data attached. So this is, I think, the preferable stack. You, you don't worry about what the server's up to. Instead, you try and reduce that boundary because at, at the end of the day, this is quite a simple interface as well. It's your app resident in memory in the browser talking to your API with HTTP requests over TCP or you know, over WebSockets or something like that. But you're not testing that HTTP works, at least I don't think you are. You're just testing that when you receive certain data, the right stuff happens. State changes in your application in the right way. And you also want to test, I suppose, that you send the right data out at the right time. So probably a lot of you have used Ember testing, but if you haven't, it, as you can see from this example, it kind of follows the, the look and feel of Capybara quite closely. And recently it's been, it's been overhauled to um, this one. It looks like a synchronous test, actually deals with any, any asynchronicity that might come out of your application. But it looks quite a lot like that Ruby test we saw earlier visit a URL, click on something, fill in some form field, click another button. And then this thing that wraps it at the end, basically all these things are going to load kind of promises into a, into a long chain. And, and then it's going to wait for every last promise to get resolved in some way or another. And then you have your opportunity to have a look at the page and see what sort of state it's in. And, um, and I love this because you're, you're down to those primitives again. You're forced to describe what on paper or in, you know, said out loud looks like quite a, you know, complex interaction. You know, I, someone shows you a screen they've designed and it's like, okay, so you, you, you pick up this element and then a 3D spin happens and then some glitter falls across the screen. It's, yeah, it's really what it is going to boil down to is, is clicks, filling in forms and you can model all of that just by triggering events and just encapsulating what these things really mean as a node fires an event and you handle it somewhere. Um, this is a, a video of, let's see if we can get it in HD. Oh no, <laughs> it probably doesn't matter. Um, so this video is, I'll load it and pause it. So on the left is the source code on the right is, um, will be the, the test runner, which is Testem in this case. And um, in the background, the browser, which, will be, which is what Testem will be driving. This is what the test looks like, which is what I just showed on the slide. And then over on the right, Testem boots. We load up that, this kind of like um, servant browser that Testem is going to drive through these tests. And you, you see this, this first failure it's tried to click on an A node containing this, this bit of text. Testum looks for it, or you know, Ember running in the browser looks for it and can't find it, and it tells us. So we go, we make an index template for the app, and we add a link to in there. We save very quickly. Testum notices the change and tells us that we're trying to link to a route that doesn't exist yet. 
And by the way, if you thought that seemed quick, this video is sped up a bit, but the reason it's so quick is because this, this application is being built with, with, with broccoli, so it's instant. So um, we'll add a root in for that, new ideas root. So now it can't find this, uh, this new idea form field that it wants to fill in. So we'll go and we'll hit up, hit up the ideas template, add a form with a, a new idea field in there, and then add button. And then we'll just say that on, in this new ideas thing, we'll display all the ideas below the form. This is kind of like a standard demo app. We save that, and it fails. The value that each loops over must be an array. So we've ended up with just this kind of generic ideas controller that doesn't know that it needs to be an array controller. So let's go and create the controller. At least I think that's what I do next. Here we go. So that, and so we see now here, there's a, there's a create action and nothing at the moment is responding to it. We add the action in. And we're green. And I just, I like, for me, that's a, a lovely way of working, working from this high level, this high level thing, letting the tests drive you through what you need to build, like only, only adding a component to the application when you really need it. And I think, especially with Ember, because of the way it's architected, you find that actually you don't need to write too many unit tests, because more often than not, you're just kind of composing the pieces that Ember gives you, letting bindings do a lot of the work for you, letting the templates do a lot of the work for you. And I think really, I've found recently the things you want to test the most are just components, like things that need to work in isolation and need to be able to be flexible and deal with lots of different kind of configurations. So uh, there's this book, which I am involved with a little bit, I have some words in some chapters on this, and this goes into testing Ember applications in some depth. This is due to be published any second now. If you're interested, um, I think the publisher said 40% off for M London, Ember London members. So um, I will put some information about that on the meetup group. And they said, just contact them. Say you come from Ember London, and they'll, they'll give you a discount code. The other interesting thing to look at is um, James Coughlin has a JavaScript testing recipes book in the works, which from what I've seen of his tweets so far, looks like it will be thorough, to say the least. And that's all I got. So I would have wanted to cover more stuff, but that's it. Uh, any questions, I guess? So you're saying that the, the one I understand is that this you know, integration level testing is replacing a lot of the unit testing you'd normally write. At what stage would you use that? That's, that's, yeah, that's. Normally, it would be a case of write an acceptance test. Yeah. Get, like, get as far as you can until you need to create some objects and then create that by creating a unit test. But I found with Ember that because so much of what you build is a matter of kind of binding things together, and you can trust the bindings. The bindings are really well tested and rock solid. So you end up with like almost no business logic that needs to be tested. There's control at those actions in controllers and routes and like maybe you test those but often they do they do very little as well they just set property and then the rest of it is taken care of by bindings I mean that's to begin with anyway I think later on like I say when components come into the picture they're worth unit testing extensively but then that's kind of easy because that's another case where I think you you trust the templates to do their job they're really well tested core part of the framework and then you just test that all your computed properties behave expectly, behave as expected on that component, and if there's anything else it needs to do that it you know, handles events correctly and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so, so you're trying to, you're trying to replace the full stack um, integration tests, but like, do you still do those? Yeah, I, so right now I am working on a project where I really don't care about the back end much at all. It just needs to be a done data store, more or less, to, to a great extent. And so the tests have been written in this style. 
acceptance test driving the driving out the GUI and then every time it needs to every time it looks like there's a point it would need to talk to an API. I'm just kind of there's a an object in the system, a service object which has a bunch of methods on it. And then for the moment they are just mocked out a bit like you do with um, Ember Data's fixture adapter. It's that kind of that kind of interface. And then what's nice is at this point a GUIs are working when it's talking to this this kind of mock API adapter, and I know what my uh, API needs to look like. I know what it needs to respond to. So now I can just kind of I have this spec. As long as I build my API to that spec, then hopefully the two will talk to each other. And yeah, there'll be I think there'll be may, not so much integration tests, maybe more like smoke tests to make sure that kind of big stabs of interaction work. Because in, so in the Ruby world, it was like addicted to like VCR yes. and like things yeah. actually like they accurately mock out the same request and there is like a, a VCR.js which at least works on Node but like I, I, I wonder if anyone's to try to use this for like uh, in browser testing well. Capturing HTTP, HTTP responses, yeah. yeah. Anyone use, it, use that? I have not used VCR.js but um, so my general sense is that if your backend is very complex, you're going to have a problem um, because now you have your front end and your back end interacting in complex ways. And VCR, like recording HTTP requests, is one of the ways you can deal with that complexity. But um, when I've seen recorded HTTP requests in repositories, they were always very, very complex and hard to maintain. So it's a stopgap at best. I'd absolutely agree with that. I've in fact been there a couple of times with yeah. It's very useful at first to be able to record something responded by a, a third party API responded with, but you it doesn't really you capture that data, you walk away for a couple of months and you look at it again and it's very difficult to dig back into it and figure out what, what's important to your application, like what you actually care about. And I think, like I, like I say, or it, I'm not sure I can really conclusively state this, but I think w you're not really testing HTTP and, and TCP. We know that works. We know if, we, if you're using you know, WebSockets or something like Firebase, you kind of trust that that part works and then you kind of work from the boundary, from that interface between you and another system, in the same way that we kind of, we trust that events flow around in a browser correctly. So we can test from the point of receiving an event, okay, then state needs to change properly and so on. I think, I think, I, I think the problem for me is the cost of creating an, an accurate sort of mock of, of an API versus just recording it and um, when it breaks, then I think, well, that's so, I was, I've been working with Braintree's API quite a lot lately. And I think, um, yeah, the, and Chris, you, um, when you gave your talk last month, yeah. working through that in the sandbox environment, and I really like the idea that you can, um, you can test things using known data. So with a credit card processing API, you know that there's a particular card number in sandbox mode, which will validate okay and like lead to a successful payment another one will give a certain type of error another one will give another kind of error so i've been working with building those into a mock api which you can then actually reuse in development mode if you want to to kind of demo things to people like okay well i know that if i put in invalid at example.com it will give me a certain kind of error and i can demo that and like i really don't care that that you know whether that comes back from a server or not so i think it's it's a little bit of trust that your the server side component will be implemented to the same spec and that you'll be able to keep them in parity but you know both ways complexity lies i think that's preferable to like you say they're very deeply knotted up server and front end components do you find it difficult on someone who doesn't have got setup or so much business budget like having to trust it to the server so my server as opposed to a third party one. Yeah. Um, and I'm finding I'm like found the other day I'm having a problem with so that boundary does cause me problems. So Edna Data, for instance, wasn't I found it wasn't serializing IDs that it already had. It, it hadn't 
because they were async relationships, because it hadn't resolved the relationships, it wasn't sending the IDs. So my server thought that it was, the client was saying that it removed the relationships, right. like that, and I kind of tripped on it by accident, it kind of explained why a lot of stuff was going wrong, <coughs> actually. But it's, it's really difficult to actually, that's the thing, when you've got, when I'm having to push the business logic onto the server, because I can't trust the client to do it, mm -hmm. um, or I've got multiple people doing different things, I need the server to resolve the logic, like I find it, I kind of uh, I have no idea how I'm going to go about testing that boundary. It's actually the boundary can. So you're saying I, I get that you're kind of saying separate it off, deal, kind of concentrate on the client and those interrelations for the user and stuff. Yeah. Um, which is a huge part of testing that the client front end works as expected. But actually, you could you could test that. And I can test my logic on my server, but if I'm testing the boundary. Stuff that's actually going to cause me big problems when the two start talking to each other. Yeah. So would you say in that kind of situation is the solution to have your kind of client tests, you say, and the server tests, obviously, for logic, and then also build some sort of test that does actually. Yeah, so together. I remember talking to someone who worked at Songkick and they they broke a very large, very slow test suite down when they switched to a service oriented architecture and they they kind of moved away from the full stack integration tests because they were so slow and difficult to maintain and understand. And because the tools move forward and your integration tests can't necessarily move quickly with them, you run into those kind of problems. But I think that perhaps the point is that if you treat these two things as two separate programs independent of each other that talk over some kind of interface, and you don't want to have to excessively test that that interface works correctly, I would hope that that, would, that kind of forces you to, to make it simple, like to make it very basic, you know, um, and that might mean offloading a lot of the logic onto the server, which, you know, I think is appropriate for a lot of applications, or more of it onto the client, in, in, which is kind of the case in your demo. I suppose actually part, just thinking about it then, actually part of the solution is like, because at the moment you do trust Ember to do a lot for you, so you just yeah. trust that the bindings are going to sort, sort stuff out for you. So I suppose actually Ember data gets to that level of stability as well. But yeah. Actually, your boundaries, or if you use, if you are using Ember data, for instance, then your boundaries are a lot more predictable. So but yeah. I suppose at the moment I don't. <laughs> I use <laughs> Ember data, but I don't trust everything it's doing. I yeah. Suppose. And in, in that case, you, I mean that. Situation you can test by like, one side of the boundary. <coughs> when I say this, this JSON should be sent. You don't yeah. have, to have to have to actually send it. So you can test that those IDs were there. Yeah. And on the server, you can have a test that says, when I get this payload, this happens. Yeah. yeah. You don't ever have to put those two together, together necessarily to have confidence yeah. that it works. That uh, makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, ideally, you'd be able to trust down the data a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I've had something like that in my in uh, my one of my last apps where I've had to have some business logic in the server because. It just, for performance reasons, it wasn't possible to do it on the client side. Um, and what I would do is, I would have a Selenium test that would, um, for every model, it would test that I can, that the client side app reads it correctly and that it writes it correctly. Mm -hmm. So it would just have a basic smoke test for every um, aspect of the app. And then for the detailed tests, they would run in JavaScript and mock the API. Right. Okay, well thank you everybody.